Okay, I'm going to go ahead and just start with prayer. Jesus, we worship you, we love you, we bless your holy name, God. There is nobody like you. There's no one above you, there's nobody besides you, God. We worship you, you're perfect in every way. God, I just thank you for this ability to get to be in your presence, God, and to feel your love, and to feel your grace, and to feel your mercy, and also to feel your correction, God. God, I thank you that when you correct us, we're your, we're your kids who listen, God, and that we receive your correction and we, we move forward. God, we love you, and we worship you, and we just ask you to be at the forefront of this meeting, God. I just ask that you, that you take control of this, God. God, I just ask you to bless these words and to, to help our hearts to receive them. In Jesus' name, amen. Ooh. Yeah, like I was saying, I had a, I don't want to go into like too much detail or anything, but um, loving people is hard, guys. <laughs> you know, when you, when you see that person and you're like, okay, I'm going to do this, we're going to help, we're going we're gonna to love you, we're going to be there, we're going to be everything that you need, right? And I say up here all the time, and it says in the Bible, love God, love people. And our job is to love God and to love people. But sometimes that love in people is so dang hard. <laughs> because sometimes they're not like you, right? They don't, they don't understand what you understand. They don't have the revelation that you have. They don't have the, the, the trust and the love and the relationship that you have built. And it's a hard time understanding where people are coming from when um, you're doing everything you can and they're just butting heads back, you know? And that's when... It's easy to love somebody that's gracious to you and that uh, does these kind of things, but it's even harder to love somebody that meets you head on, even though you're just trying to just be there for them, you know? So I just want to encourage you guys, like, loving people's hard, you know? It's easy to say, love God, love people. It's easy, guys. Just go out and tell them about Jesus, you know? But it's hard. It's hard. Um, But the more you do it, the better you get at it, right? Oh, I've seen this. I know this. I recognize this. Okay, I know what to do. Love them. But there's a difference between loving them and letting them do and setting boundaries, right? You got rules, you got regulations, you got boundaries, you got stuff that you need to do. And that's, that's holy to God. That's good to God. He wants you to have those in your life because he's, he's set stuff in your life where you can be effective in loving people. And sometimes you try to love somebody so much that it ends up not being good. Um, and we need to realize when we're in that position, you know. And I've been in that position. It's, it's tough when you're in that position because you don't want to let go, you're like, no, we're better than this. We're bigger than this. We can push through. But sometimes God's like, are you listening to me? <laughs> yes, I am. Okay, then what are you still doing? You know? So, yeah, loving people is not easy, man. Sometimes it is. Sometimes it's second nature. Some, some people want to be loved. And some people want to be loved but just don't know how to be loved and how to accept your help and, and to just understand that wow, what they're doing is a big deal for me. Like, nobody else would do that. And sometimes they just don't get that revelation. But what do you do? You send them on their way, and you still love them. You still love them, and you still bless them. And you just let them know very clearly, this is this, this is that, and I love you, but this is, this is done, you know? So, yeah, that's all I want to say. Loving people is hard. <laughs> that's the lesson I'm learning this week yet again. <laughs> like, how many times must I, you know, that's what's cool about God is because you just keep learning, you just keep growing, and he keeps, he keeps expanding you and pushing you, and, and something you thought was so easy, he's like, okay, <laughs> you're cute, Jesse. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> All right, I'm going to jump into the worship part. Amazing, you guys. I mean, come on. It's just, it's it. It's the ushering in the presence of God and getting us, getting us in that atmosphere. It's just it's, you guys are very good at it. I love it. And I just have in capital, cap, capitalizations, how great is our God, huh? I mean, come on, you could, you could just wake up in the morning singing that, and it'll, it'll just renew your mind. How great is our God? And then ask yourself when you're done with that, how great is he? How great is he to you? You can say and you can sing how great he is, is he great to you? Is he doing great things in your life? Are you giving him credit for those great things he's doing in your life? So when we say he's, he's a great God who deserves to be worshipped greatly, 
But how do we do that? I mean, we can say great, how great is our God, but do we actually realize and hold on to how great he actually is? It's awesome. And then the way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. And then, it goes, and then on that part, I go, my God, <laughs> you know, ownership to it. Because these are the things that he is. He's a way maker. He's a miracle worker. He's a promise keeper. He's your light in the darkness. You know? You need a miracle? He's your miracle worker. Come on. He's, he's, it's, a, it's a miracle worker. So, like, for me, it's not just like when you're, when you're working, he's working off that miracle. Sometimes it's instantaneous, but sometimes when you ask him for a miracle, he's working it, right? promise keeper. He's always that. He gives you that promise. He will keep it without fail. Are you going through some darkness? He's your light in the darkness. Come on. And then I just love putting that ownership on it. My God. And then you declare it. That is who you are. Come on. Is he that in your life? Is he your miracle worker? Is he your promise keeper? Is he your light in the darkness? Is he your God? He is or he isn't, right? I'm telling you, he is. <laughs> you just need to take ownership of that relationship. And then I've said this one many times before, but even when I don't see it, you're working. You never stop working. Why? Because that is who you are. Come on. <sighs> That is who you are. Is, but, but is he that to you, right? Because that is who he is. But he can so very easily not be that to you. You can feel like you're just all alone and nothing's working, but he never stops. Even when you don't see it, he's working. <laughs> you might be sleeping, but he's working. You might be taking a break and on scrolling through your phone, but he never stops, never stops working. Ah, so good, you guys. I just wanted to like just, I just had a rough week and I just wanted to just say, it's like, God, just, just break out and let me just say it. <laughs> sit right there and just worship you. But this is worship too. So I'm going to go, um, still stuck in Hebrews. Um, I'm going to fast forward it to chapter 10. I was talking to my wife this morning and she was like, what are you preaching on? And I was like, I hope you're not in kid zone so you can see. <laughs> and she's not. Praise God. I uh, really felt in my heart <clears throat> this week to, um, and even the week before, just talk, t- realizing like sin consciousness in your life. Because um, there's a lot of people that live their life just so sin conscious that they're like heavenly worthless, you know? They're, they're just so focused on what they're doing wrong and how they're doing it wrong and how they can never get it right. But, man, we'll get into it. Let's go. All right, Hebrews chapter 10, Christ's sacrifice once and for all. The old system under the law of Moses was only a shadow, a dim preview of the good things to come, not the good things themselves. The sacrifice under the system were repeated again and again, year after year, but they were never able to provide perfect cleansing for those who came to worship. If they could have provided perfect cleansing, the sacrifice would have stopped, for the worshipers would have been purified once for all time, and their feelings of guilt would have disappeared. But instead, those sacrifices actually reminded them of their sins year after year. For it is not possible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Whew. So, so back then, um, I, I just love this because um, I used to like when I first got saved, I kind of just swam in Hebrews for a long time, and it just made so much sense to me um, what these first four verses were saying, um, because, you know, they would all, they would all take their sacrifice and their, their best bull, and then they would go, and then the high priest would, would go on their behalf, and then they would kill it, and then you would, you would like, just be quote-unquote clean, because that's, like, what's required by the law. And then my, what I'm thinking is the second they left there, 
unclean. Like, come on. God was just like, here's, here's these laws, and then here's what you have to do for here. And then none of it's like obtainable, right? And this is where, this is where like the Old Testament and stuff always just points back to Jesus. And, this, and that's where this is pointing and I have in my notes, it pretty much reminded them of their sins and consistently pointed out to how they failed. Animals' blood could never make you clean. Can you imagine a life where you relive your past sins over and over and over, and you just can't get over that? Some people are living that life, right? And it just blows my mind that... Um, People are, are living that way because they don't, they don't have a grasp of what Jesus did because he was this, I don't want to spoil it, we're going to get into there, but he was the sacrifice once and for all, right? Because we, don't, we weren't made to have a guilty conscience and an unclean conscience because we were made to be holy just as he is holy. So can you imagine just never being able to get over your filth, something I did in high school or something I did, you know, whenever, just to be able to, to constantly just be thinking, oh, man, I'm such an idiot, I can't believe I did that, or God, I can't believe I failed you in this way. But he's given us an access to where it doesn't have to be that way. Because, yeah, we'll get into it. I'm getting ahead of myself. All right, let's go to five. Um, that is why when Christ came into the world, he said to God, you did not want animal sacrifices or sin offerings, but you have given me a body to offer. Thank you. You were not pleased with burnt offerings or other offerings for sin. Then I said, look, I have come to do your will, O God, it is as it is written about me in the scriptures. Old Testament, that's pointing. For Christ said, you did not want an animal sacrifice or sin offerings or burnt offerings and other offerings for sin, nor were you pleased with them, though they are required by the law of Moses. Then he said, look, I have come to do your will. He cancels the first covenant in order to put the second into effect. Come on. For God's will was for us to be made holy by the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all time. Hallelujah. Woo! Come on. How can you not read that and just be like, he did it. He did it. You should have so much relief in your life because he did it. It used to be this way. It's not anymore. Oh, I'm just so grateful for this because I don't have to live my life that way. Some people live their life that way. There's so many people that go to bed at night with no peace. There's so many people driving in the car with no peace because they don't know. They do know. They do. Because God, God, God's telling them and he's pursuing them. They, they, they have an understanding of it a little bit. But maybe that's us. We need to be like, hey, you know, because he's whispering to him and he's telling them, but they won't listen. Sometimes he needs us to go and tell him. Can you imagine that? I mean, I just, over and over again, that's why I'm so grateful when I read it right here because I'm not one of those people because I know what he did for me and I receive what he did for me and I don't have to live that way. Not for a second do I have to have the devil steal my peace. I don't let him steal my peace because he can't. He can try and then you feel it and then you're like, oh, I recognize that. That's my peace leaving. Nope, that's not yours. It is mine. <laughs> like the forceful men lay hold of it, Right? I'm going to fight for my peace. And guess what? I really don't have to fight that hard because he's already won the battle. So sometimes we feel like we have to fight really hard just to get our peace back. But really, we don't. Turn your face to him. Listen to what he said. Enact it and do what he said. You don't have peace in your life? Get with Jesus. Are you struggling to sleep? Close your eyes and just look at his face. You'll, you'll go to sleep, I promise you. Remember when I was having trouble sleeping when I was a kid, my dad said, just close your eyes and don't open them. I guarantee you'll fall asleep. Best advice, guys. Your kids can't fall asleep. Tell them, close your eyes. Don't open them. Not once. And tell me how you did in the morning. Tell me how long you lasted. I'm telling you. Cheat code right there. Can you imagine, though? I mean, we can all imagine because we've all, we've all been in that place, right? Where we've just been sick and desperate and lonely. <laughs> Praise God, we're not that, right? And if you are feeling that, what do we do? 
what are we doing? He's already paid the price. It's like, it's like you're eating at a restaurant and you have this bill and you're worried about how you're going to pay it and you're avoiding the waitress and ordering one more water and uh, uh, i got to go to the bathroom again and I'm just waiting and then when you get up there to finally pay your bill to tell the person that you don't have the money, they said it's been taken care of. It's just it because we're worried about the wrong things in life. That was, a good, that was a weird analogy that just popped in my head, but it happens like that. All right, if I can see my Bible, we can continue. <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah, I don't want to skip this. Uh, in the 510, it says, We have been made holy, not by our doing, but by His. I mean, come on. We need to, like, so, like, if we've been made holy, right? Some, do you guys always feel holy? And the decisions that you make and the way you live your life, like when you, like, do you feel holy all the time? Because guess what? You're made to be holy just as he is holy. But that's what's cool because it says, let me make sure I'm right, right doing this. It says being made holy, right? Let me make sure I read it. It's only sacrifice the body of Christ once on time. It comes up later. Um, But... Like, as in being made holy, right? You're not, you're not just immediately holy. You have all this holiness, and it's an access that you have to draw from. So the more you draw from this access, the more you're being made holy. So if, you, if you're saying, well, I'm not very holy in the stuff I do and the way I live my life, well, guess what? That's the Holy Spirit talking to you right now saying, hey, you're not being these things. But guess what? We can help you because it's not like, hey, be holy, and you... Be holy. Be holy. You're not being holy? How come you're not being holy? You're called to be made holy. He helps you. He loves you. He says, hey, come on, man. This is where we can start being holy. Hey, let's clean up our talk a little bit when we're around people. When you're outside of church or you're on a construction job site, let's clean some stuff up a little bit. When you get out of that truck, he says, hey, let's be holy. Oh, it's a choice. Okay. Okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take your hand and I'm going to be made holy, right? Because it just doesn't happen overnight. It's a step-by-step, and that's what's cool about your relationship with God because he doesn't just say, here, be all these things, and I'll, I'll check back with you a little bit later. He, he says, come on, I'm with you. I'm here, step-by-step. Step. And then when you don't feel like he's here, I said it all the time, just turn around, he's right there. If you feel far from God, you're not. You're, you never can be. It's not possible. You can be far in your head, and the devil can tell you you're far, and he'll try everything he can to say he's 10 miles out. And Like I said, I think I said this last week, but he's just one inch away, you know? It's just a matter of turning your face to him, you know? Just think about it on a nice, bright, sunny day, and then you, you close your eyes, and then you just look up, and you feel it. Can you feel that in a, in a, in a dark room, you know what I mean? Can you turn your face to him and just, just feel his presence? right? Because it's an access. It's a relationship that's there. And I'm not saying just focus on the physical, but there's a, there's a shift that happens when you just tune in and you plug into the throne room and you say, it's just you that I seek and only you. Speak to me. Love me. Be with me. And then just sit there and let him love you. Let him talk to you. Let him just be with you. Man. All right, number 11. Under the old covenant, the priest stands and ministers before the altar day after day, offering the same sacrifices again and again, which can never take away sin. Whose job is that? (laughs) Every day, take and take. And it doesn't even take away the sin. But but our high priest, who is our high, high priest? Does anybody know? What's his name? Jesus, right. We talked about it last week, too. Or last week, last month. It just seems like a week that I was here, up here again. Just the whole thing is so fast. Life is fast, guys. But our high priest, whew, let's say it again. But our high priest, come on, we got one of those, offered himself to God as a single sacrifice for sins. Guess what, guys? Good for all time. How long is it good for? All time, come on. There's no expiration date on there. Then he sat down in the place of honor at God's right hand. Our high priest, the one who sacrificed himself, 
is at the right hand of the throne, at the right hand of God. That's who's in your corner, guys. He's right there. Sin just seems like a big deal until you know where he's sitting, until you know who's advocating for you, who's sitting there saying, my son, I love that one. Yes, I died for that one. And God said, not guilty. Man. Wrap your head around that, guys. Then he sat down at the place of honor at God's right hand. There he waits until his enemies are humbled and made a footstool under his feet. Thank you, Jesus. For by that one offering, he forever made perfect those who are being made holy. And I was ahead of myself on that 10, but it says being made holy. It's a process, right? And it didn't say um, for, the, for the ones that are holy. It says for the ones that are being made holy. Thank you, God, for that grace and that mercy that he knows that, we, that we're just getting work, right? He knows that we're, we're just stepping through it and we're living life. And he says, there he is. He made a good choice. You guys need to realize that, too. When you make that good choice, bro, he is jumping and, and hugging and kissing. Like, he is just so excited when you make that tiny little bit of holiness, that, that, that little decision that you make. He is leaping for you. And you might think... Well, I did, you know, I mean, normally you, you, you blast off and don't even think about it, and then maybe you controlled yourself four or five times, but yeah, you did, uh, you did stumble still during that. Do you think he's looking at where he stumbled still during that? He says, my son, you did it. A little bit. I'll take it. It's everything for me. Because he knows that little bit will turn into a more little bit, and little bit, and little bit, and over the years of your life, you're going to be made holy because you're going to be walking in a relationship with him and you're going to be conscious of, of being holy and walking in holiness. And, and then pretty soon sin won't be a, like a struggle for you because you're not even going to be thinking about it because that's not who you are and that's not who you, what you do. And, it, and it'd be nice if we could you know, go back to, to nine-year-old Jesse and just be like, hey, here's the Holy Spirit here's this and here's what you need to know. Like, that'd be really cool to restart my life knowing what I know now um, and seeing where I would be. But again, I'm just, I'm getting right now that I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a hard critic on myself and God is exactly happy and pleased with where I am in my life right now and how I'm walking and how I'm striving to just just be with him, right? So right, right now I was just like, man, I wish I could go back when I was nine and I'd be in a way better place. No, God said I'm happy with the place you're in right now. Right? We don't have to wish that we can go back and do that. Another good thought that's swimming around in there. Okay. And let's see, 15. Um, And the Holy Spirit also testifies this. All right. And the Holy Spirit also testifies that this is so. For he says, this is the new covenant I will make with my people On that day, says the Lord, I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. Then he says, I will never again remember their sins and lawless deeds. Golly. And when sins have been forgiven, there is no need to offer any more sacrifices. I'm leaping here, guys. I will never again remember their sins and lawless deeds. And then that's what I'm talking about, being sin conscious, because sometimes we can live our life and we can be so conscious on where we mess up and how we mess up and when we mess up and when we sin and you know we, we come to God and we repent and it's like, oh God, I'm so sorry, I get it. And he's like, for what? Oh, that? I don't remember that because he's already forgiven that, right? So no matter what you've done in your life, he, he, Jesus died for every past, present, and future sin, right? 
And to, and to say that God doesn't remember it and hold it over your head because him and Jesus had that discussion. And he said, Jesse, yes, mine, forgiven. So who are you to just swim in what you've done wrong for this long in your life? You know, how many times can we think back to something that we did and it's just a big deal in our life? And if I wouldn't have done that, my life would be different and all this kind of stuff. Why are we living a sin conscious life instead of a life conscious of being full of the Holy Spirit and walking in holiness? Like, why are we walking around thinking about bad things we've done or, oh, well, I hope I, I, hope I don't do this and I need to work on that. But if we're just swimming and I love you, Jesus, and I worship you and, and you are going to be my mouth and you're going to be my ears and you're going to be my eyes. Because if you're so busy focused on, your, on his face, then you won't be living a sin conscious life because you won't be sinning because you'll be loving God and loving people. And it won't be something that you have to strive and try hard for and really correct yourself on. You will, but hear what, I, hear what I'm saying because there's a relationship with the Holy Spirit and he helps guide you the more you walk. And if you think you can do it on your own, you're just going to be struggling and hitting, hitting points and getting trudged down. But if he says, hey, hey, pick up your feet. Oh, okay. Boom. Boom. I got it. Hey, left, left. Oh, okay. Got it. And then if we're just in our own world, we're, we're just tripping all over everything and we're getting beat up by the world. And pretty soon you're going to go to bed thinking about this happened and that happened and this happened. And guess what? The devil's stealing your peace and he's stealing that time where you get to lay down and put your head on your pillow and say, Thank you, God, for another day. And then he gets to remind you of, of the good stuff that happened in your day. He said, we have some good fruit here, and we want this fruit to remain, and we want this fruit to last. But how can we be focused on that kind of stuff if we're not looking at his face and we're just looking at what we do wrong? Oh, I'm, I'm really trying to hammer this home because I know that there's, this was a big issue in my life where I would just be so sin conscious that I was just useless. Like I wouldn't, you know, like sometimes I feel un unworthy or something like that. Like I'm not even worthy to come up here and preach the gospel. And he's like, who are you talking to? You know, because sometimes you just don't feel, like I don't feel worthy to help that person. I just don't feel like I'm, I'm capable of, I just had such a rough day today. I just, I'm just going to walk by that person in the grocery store that you told me to talk to. It's just a tough day, you know? What are we missing? Because he wants to do work. Even when you don't see it, he's working. And sometimes you're that worker. Or you can just, he never stops working. Why? Because he's got people and he's got a bride that loves him. That's why he never stops working. He has the best team and you're part of it. And you need to realize that you need to get your junk out of the way. Because that's not a big deal to him. He's already cleared it out. It's like you have a, a garage full of stuff and you just every day you look at it and you're overwhelmed and he's already paid the movers to come and he already has the dumpster there to throw away your trash. You just need to realize that it's there and that the access is ready for you to just unload it. You got a bunch of junk in your life? Get on your knees and unload it to him. You got some conversations in your life that you've been avoiding with God? Boy, you're gonna, what are you doing? I, I'd hate to be you falling asleep at night when you don't ha when you have some stuff to face with God and you're just not doing it. How how restless that night would be. How unpeaceful your day to day operations would be. How how dysfunctional your relationship is with family and friends and coworkers and all that. It's just dysfunctional because you're you don't have that relationship with Him and you're letting this thing just be a big bear in your life when really it's just a little ant that you just sweep away, right? And, it's, and it's, it's easy to say, okay, right? Um, it's another thing to do. Just like I started out with uh, loving people is hard, right? I think I'm good at loving people. And I, I think that um, I have the ability to, to, to help people and to usher them and to love them. And, you know, this week I just was like, dang, man, loving people is hard. Why? Because God's stretching me. And he's teaching me, right? And I, I can look back and see where I quote unquote failed. But did I? Was I loving this person with my full capacity? Yes. God said good. And now he expanded my, my knowing of that capacity to love somebody because he's stretching me and he's building me. It's like I've been bench pressing and bench pressing. And then God adds another plate and I'm like, this is easy. Oh, jeez. 
that extra five pounds is something. And then you're like, oh, you have a decision. Now this is too tough. I quit. Or you can build those muscles and you can keep loving people. And then you can keep just stop thinking about the filth in your life because you're not a filthy person, okay? You're made holy, righteous. You're redeemed. Why? Because he gave his life for you. He didn't give his life up on that cross, bloody, bruised, beaten, disfigured, so that you can just be like, oh, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? I got this, I got that. Get over yourself. He's already paid it, you know? Let's see where we're at. 15 through 18, yep. And then also, um, something I wanted to hammer home too is, um, I'm not really good at Greek, um, but my, my friend told me this years ago, and it just absolutely blew my mind. But the Greek word, uh, himeartha, it means to miss the mark, okay? And we were talking about sin, and this is probably five years ago or so, and we were talking about sin and what it's like to, to like just get people to realize that they're, they're just focused on their sin in life instead of focusing on the good of God and how they can, how they can better their life and walk with the Holy Spirit. Um, and then so hemiartha in the Greek means to miss the mark. So if you get the visual of uh, like somebody with a bow and arrow and uh, they're all lined up and they're looking at their target and they shoot. And they're aiming for that bullseye. Boom. And then they hit bottom. Okay. And they're going to be like, oh, I missed the mark. Guy, I suck at this. Why can't I just... Why can't I just hit that mark? Pick it up again. And then now they're so conscious of missing the mark, that's all they think about. And then they're no good at it. Because if you're constantly focusing on whether you sin or not, you're struggling, okay? Because you don't want to live your life saying, like, okay, how can I not sin today? Because if you're loving God and you're walking with the Holy Spirit, you're not even going to be thinking about that sin because you're going to be thinking about how to love somebody. You're not going to be thinking about, oh, I shouldn't react in this way. Okay, be good. Sometimes it is that, right? Sometimes we're growing, but sometimes when you're walking with him, your immediate response is, mm, I love you, bro. You can say that to me, but I don't receive that. And I'm sorry you feel that way, but what can we do to get past this? Because I love you, and that's not who you are, and that's not how you talk to people. And that's not how I'm going to talk to you, right? That's just because you're not missing the mark. You're not focused on, God, you missed it again. Today you did the same thing you did yesterday, Jesse, and you're laying on that pillow and you're like, tomorrow will be better. Oh yeah, sure, it will be better because, you know, the whole past week was better, right? What makes you think tomorrow is going to be better? Because you're so focused on hitting that mark and not doing that thing when really you should just be focused on loving him and worshiping him. You have, a, you have a, this urge to do this thing. You won't have the urge to do this thing if you start, if you get up and you start saying, how great is our God? Sing with me, how great. I mean, come on, Jesus, I worship you, I love you. Because you're not going to want to go into that pattern and into that spot if you're worshiping the King of Kings. If you're just saying, I worship you, God. I feel like doing this right now, and I feel like being that, but I know that I'm, I know that I'm not. Because sometimes, most times, the devil can trick you into thinking and sliding into that habit so easily because that's what you do. That's who you are. That's how long you've been doing this for a long time. Well, that's not who you are. Who you are is somebody who, who when they struggle, they eat the word. When you struggle, you, you turn your face to Jesus. When you struggle, you shut the whole entire world out and you say, it's just me and it's just you. None of that matters. And if he doesn't matter to you, do what I just said. Go shut that door. Go close your eyes and say, God, I'm here until you matter. And then truly mean it. God, take your best shot. I don't feel that you're real. Right? Anybody listening online, you don't feel like he's real? Try it. He doesn't disappoint there. Okay, I'm going to get going. Okay. Okay. They call to persevere. And so, dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter into heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. By his death, Jesus opened a new life-giving way through the curtain into the most holy place. 
And since we have a great high priest, what's his name? Who's the high priest? Jesus, come on. And since we have a great high priest who rules over God's house, let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting him. For our guilty consciences have been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean, and our bodies have been washed with pure water. Golly. I love it. Man, I'm sorry, man. Hebrews 10 is just, it just, it hits me, it nails me, it makes me excited. I love it. It says, since, since we have a high priest, we can enter in. We have that access, right? You don't, you don't feel like you're in God's presence sometime? Then what's going on? He died for that access. This man died for that. And I'm just telling you, there's, there's something special about just, just being, right? Just simply being in God's presence. For our guilty consciences, I'm going to read this again. For our guilty consciences have been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean, and our bodies have been washed with pure water. Do you receive that, right? Is, is that true? And I like the, the whole analogy of the, the sprinkled, because like if you have a recipe, um, my daughter Allie would just love this one. I would tell her afterwards. Um, but if you have like a recipe and then you just sprinkle that missing ingredient, that little bit of salt in there, <laughs> and then it, oh wait, we're, we are salt, right? We're salt of the earth. It, it can change the whole recipe. It can change the whole way you think. You can be all wrapped up and bent up, but as soon as Jesus gets sprinkled into there, ugh, oh, this isn't important, you know? Because we can be wrapped up in our bills and our deadlines and everything, but just think, like, come on, I can just hear it in my spirit. Whenever I'm, God, whenever I'm having a bad time, whisper to me, Jesus, he's paid that price. He's done that so that you don't have to live that way. He's washed your body clean with pure water. All right, I love this one. Let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm, for God can be trusted to keep his promise. What is he? He's a promise keeper, right? Didn't we go over that? He's a promise keeper. But this is what I, I'm just like, I can't stress enough. The first part, let us hold tightly without wavering. Um, one of my, like, I was going to say good friends, but, I mean, we know each other, but a uh, really great evangelist, his name is uh, Eric Gilmore, and he's just he just oozes intimacy, right? And then one time at a question and answer, somebody said, uh, Somebody said, um, how do you know God's real? And he said, because I cling to him. And that just absolutely blew my mind because it says right here in Hebrews, and I remembered this verse, let us hold tightly. Come on. If I have my daughter with me, nobody can take her. Why? Because I'm holding her tightly. And he's holding you tightly. And he wants you to, he wants you to reciprocate that. And he wants you to want to hold on so if sin's trying to pull you away and bad thoughts are trying to pull you away and depression and anxiety is trying to pull you away, it can't. Why? Because I cling so tightly to you. You can't pull me away because this is my dad. I'm clinging to him. Are you, are you clinging to him, right? Are you holding and are you not wavering even though you get pulled and pulled? No, I cling to him. I hold on to him. I will not waver. I will be with you. Because I'm telling you, that's how you're going to get through some of the junk in your life. You got you to gotta hold on to him. You got to hold on to the promises that he said to you. He's a promise keeper and he won't fail you. You just got to keep gripping and keep holding. I feel like there's a hurricane coming and you're just hold on a little longer is what he says. You don't know. God, this is going to be forever. You don't know that. You don't know how long this trial will last you. Just hold on. I love it. Let us hold tightly without wavering. He can be trusted. Do you guys trust him, though? That's a big deal. Trusting God. Like that's a, that was a new concept for me. Um, I remember one time I was worshiping, and I was like, God, 
I trust you. And I'm melted. Because it was a new concept for me to trust him. To just just have him, just to know that what you say is true and that even though I'm going through a struggle and it feels big, I trust you and I love you and I know that you're going to see me through this. Your mad just blew my mind when I realized that I could trust him. And then it made me realize the times that I wasn't trusting him. And then what did I do? I didn't go and dwell on all those times that I didn't trust him because he didn't remember those. I just know from here on out I'm going to trust you. Okay, uh, 24. Let us think of good ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect our meeting together, as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. Thank you, Jesus. Let us think of ways to motivate one another, right? It says it right here. How can I motivate you, right? Right? How can you guys motivate each other? Like what in our like that's a that's a good thought to have, right? Because it's it's totally not a selfish thing. How can I motivate my how can I motivate my brother? You know? Can I go and I give give him a word? You know? Can I can I go and encourage them? How about you just go and ask them how their day was? How about you go and ask them how their week is? Invest in these people in this room too, right? How, invest in their life. How, who, who are their kids? What are they going through? What's their job? Or do they like it? You know, and I struggle at that. I mean, it's just, I just, there's a lot of stuff going on in life, right? But, but how, let's encourage each other, right? Let's spur each other on to good things. Hi, brother, how's your heart? Share a testimony with me. What did, what did God do in your life this week? Oh, I don't know. Okay. Let me give you an example of what he did in my life this week. What do you think? And then next week, ask him again. Hey, what's God doing in your life? You're, you're motivating them because they know when they see Jesse, he's going to, I didn't have to answer to him or anything, but he, I know that Jesse's going to ask me, what's God doing in your life? Share a testimony with me. Share a testimony with somebody. That's how you motivate somebody. Hey, I know you didn't ask, but brother, man, I met this guy at a gas station, and it was crazy. We, I just, you know what I mean? There's the possibilities are endless that you can motivate somebody with, with your testimony, right? Because you don't know what people are going through sometimes, and when you walk away and they think in their head, I really needed that. Thank you, God. And let us not neglect this meeting together, right? You guys know how blessed we are to be able to meet right now. There's people that don't have this, right? There's people in other countries that they have underground churches where people memorize the Bible because they don't have one and they're not allowed to have one. Can you imagine memorizing all of Hebrews or all of Matthew, right? They have some people come and they say, what do you want me to preach? They say, just preach because they, haven't, they can't hear the Bible. They don't know the Bible. They just want to hear somebody preach the Bible. And we have one of these, we have this access every single day, and some of us neglect it, and there's people that would die for this book, right? And we just neglect our, our meeting together. And when I think, let us not neglect our meeting together, I feel like that's God talking to me as well. He says, Jesse, let's not neglect our meeting together. Let's meet. Let's meet again, and then let's meet again, because I'm not going to neglect meeting with God. I'm going to set an appointment with him and keep it because I have that access and I have that knowing and I have that relationship and it would just be foolish for me not to. And it'd be foolish for me. And you know what? I have neglected meetings with God sometimes, right? And I have neglected God in my life where I didn't pray every day and I didn't read every day. And then you know where I got to be? Dysfunctional, anxious, depressed, lonely. You have the best friend ever. His name is Jesus. All right, let's see. Dear friends, 26. Dear friends, if we deliberately continue sinning after we, and I love this, here we go, we're getting into it. Dear friends, if we deliberately continue sinning after we have received knowledge of the truth, there is no longer any sacrifice that will cover these sins. There is only one terrible expectation of God's judgment and the raging fire that will consume his enemies. For anyone who refused to obey the law of Moses was put to death without mercy on the testimony of two to three witnesses. Just think how much worse the punishment will be for those who have trampled on the Son of God 
and have treated the blood of the covenant which made us holy as if we were common and unholy and have insulted and disdained the Holy Spirit who brings God's mercy to us. For we know the one who said, I will take revenge. I will pay them back. He also said, the Lord will judge his own people. Good night. It's a terrible thing to fall into the hands of a living God. So if you remember um, in Hebrews 2, um, it, it talked about what happened, you know, when, when you sinned and how there was still something to pay for, right? It's not a free-to-send card, right? Grace is not a free-to-send card. Oh, well, you, you just said that God will remember my sin no more. Have you repented of it? Have you accepted Jesus as your Savior? Because guess what? That's the sacrifice that covers all. And if you don't have that and accept that, then brother, it's not, not looking good. But you guys got to realize that God is full of grace and he's full of mercy. And um, when you accept him um, and you start walking and, and being made holy, the Holy Spirit is helping you. He's guiding you. He's teaching you. And he says, hey, hey, not this time, you know, not this time. Like if you have a problem stealing something and then, the, you know, year after year, the Holy Spirit's like, mm, mm, and he's telling you not to steal and you just keep on doing it and keep on doing it. Jeez, that's, that's not good, guys. Because the Holy Spirit's there, he's helping you. He's helping you be, um, I was going to say conscious of your sin, but he's helping you being conscious of your better than that, that you have a relationship, that somebody, that like Jesus died for you. So it's not, a, you know, I don't know how, how much I can get this across. God doesn't remember your sin for those that are his, right? But there is a judgment, and it's a very real judgment. And, and a lot of people are, you know, and I can be guilty of this too, where we just live, in a, live and preach in a sunshine and rainbows type atmosphere, but there's real judgment. He's a real God. And there's a real sacrifice, and there is a real choice that needs to be made. And there's honestly a real choice that needs to be made every single day of your life. Every day you wake up, good morning, how are you? I'm good, be with me. And he says, yes, be with me, I will. <laughs> Go and send no more. <laughs> okay, let me see where I'm at. I'm wrapping it up, guys. Okay, um, verse 32. Oh, come on. <laughs> I'll try to get through this part. Think back on those early days when you first learned about Christ. Remember how you remained faithful, even though it meant terrible suffering. Golly, melt me away with that one. Remember when Christ became real to you for the first time, right? And you're like, I remember when somebody accepts Christ, they're like, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this. And it's just the zeal that they have in their heart and the ability to do it because they have a real revelation of Jesus Christ. And it's so real and it's so new that they don't want anything but you. And how, how fast we can forget that. You know, I want to live in a world where I wake up and he's just as new as he was the first time. Is that possible, right? Can he be just as new to us when that first time when your hands were out and you said, you're so real. And he became real. I just remember the tears streaming down my face. And the first time I began to speak in tongues, God, take me back every single day to that moment when you became real. Does he not feel real to you sometimes? Are you in a struggle where he just doesn't feel like it's supposed to? Why can't we just step back and remember that day that he first became real to us? Why can't we take that moment and we tuck it away and we hide it in our hearts? Because I draw back on that a lot of times in my life. Because... The day he first became real to me is when my life changed. I was able to be a good dad. 
I was able to be a good person. I was able to be a good friend. I was able to be a good worker. I was able to be a good son. Because he's so real and he's speaking to you. And now all of a sudden you're like, oh, that's your voice? I want to listen to that one. Help me make that voice bigger than anything in my life. And I love the, um, remember how you remain faithful, even though it meant terrible suffering. And they're, they're speaking... Um, they're speaking about people who went from Judaism to Christianity, and these guys were like hardcore persecuted. I'm talking killed, disowned, all that kind of stuff. But how this, this is the context of that and how that relates to our time now is that when you guys accepted Jesus, I don't think no stones were thrown at you, right? I don't think any, well, some people kicked out of their families or whatever. But I know when I accepted Jesus, a lot of stuff changed. And you know what? It felt terrible, because I didn't have any quote-unquote friends anymore. I couldn't, I couldn't have as good a relationship with my brother because we just didn't relate. Because all we did was smoke pot and drink beer. But once I start talking about Jesus, I guess a really high person doesn't want to just sit down and listen to how good God is. <laughs> but these things seemed terrible to me when they were happening. Right? Because these are relationships. These are lifestyles, and all of this is about to change in my life, and I don't know what I'm going to do, but I know that you're real, and this is where I want to go, and this is what I want to do. And sometimes it felt, it felt tough, right? I mean, you guys can all relate. This is just my side of it, but there's some real stuff that happened when you accepted Jesus, and depending on your age, you know, I had to quit hanging out with this group of friends, and then, you know, I'd still try to love them, but it just was different. And I, I've shared this story before, but me and my wife went out to eat like a year or so after I was saved, and we had some time, and she said, why don't you go hang out with your friends? You haven't done that in a while. And I went, I went and sat in the car, and I took out my phone, and I didn't know who to call. <laughs> because none of those people were good for me. And it felt terrible, right? felt lonely. That was when the Holy Spirit just sat in the car. And he said, don't think for a second that you lost your friends. He was like, I cut those people out of your life and you have gained the best friend you'll ever have. So hanging out with my friends at that point looked like sitting in my car, turning on worship music. I'm hanging out with the best friend you could ever have. So sometimes when you change your life and you change things in your life, it might seem terrible, right? Because that's all you knew. You only knew that. And now all of a sudden you know somebody else and he's become real to you. And you're coming out of that and you're coming into this and this is new and this is different and this is not what I'm used to. That stuff is terrible. <laughs> that life you're living and that person you were, that's terrible. But when you come into a revelation of Jesus Christ and that you are made to be holy and that your body is washed pure, that's when real stuff can start to happen. And I sat there in that car and I worshipped. And Cindy asked, how was it? <laughs> the best. <laughs> but what are those terrible things? Are they really that terrible? Are they, though? They're not good for you. God's cutting it out of your life if you just let him. If you'd let him just prune your life and let go of that crap that you hold so dearly, you would realize about a month later that that was no good for you, and you are in a much better place. And those are the hard conversations that you have with God, where it's not easy to let go, and it's not easy to make that change. Why? Because you've been in that life, and that's who you have been being. It's just like when I said you have that, that spirit puppy and that flesh puppy, and you've been feeding that flesh puppy. So, of course, that flesh puppy is going to be stronger than your spirit puppy. But if you start feeding that spirit puppy, it will devour the flesh puppy, and you won't want to be doing the things of the flesh because you walk in the spirit. And you don't want to know what it's like to walk in the flesh. It's a struggle, guys. All right, only a couple more verses. I'm sorry, we're gone. 
Sometimes, I think 33, sometimes you were exposed to public ridicule and you were beaten, and sometimes you helped others who were suffering the same things. You suffered along with those who were thrown into jail, and when you, and when all you owned was taken from you, you accepted it with joy. You knew there were better things waiting for you that will last forever. So I should have read that part and then said what I said. But look at all the things that were happening then, right? There was just, everything is just being taken from them, and they're being thrown in jail, and they have to watch their friends and families persecuted. Are you going through that right now when you accepted Jesus? I think we have a lighter task than what was happening then. It's the same kind of deal, it's just different, right? It's different in how we relate, and sometimes we view it as a really big deal, but you guys, you can get through it. All right, 35. So do not throw away this confident trust in the Lord. Remember the great reward it brings you. Patient endurance is what you need now so that you will continue to do God's will. Then you will receive all that God has promised. And then years ago, I wrote down in here in my side notes, God help me with my frozen heart. (laughs) I was having a hard time loving people <laughs> back then. It was just uh, tough. But um, on 36, the word is uh, patient. Endurance is what you need now. Okay? Are you patient? <laughs> it's going to take patience, guys. It says it right here. It's going to take patience. Are you a patient person? When, when the world is beating down your door... Are you patient? And then also endurance. It's tough. It's to keep going, right? To keep going patiently when the world is trying to beat you down. So God has asked you to give me patient endurance when the trials come along. That I can be calm and just, I was going to say, just fall back into you. Take a look at my situation and handle it appropriately. Because that's what we need. For just a little while, the coming one, woo, the coming one will come and not delay, and my righteous ones will live by faith. But I will take no pleasure in anyone who turns away. Sheesh. I just sheeshed it on, on a sermon. That's pretty funny. Sheesh. but I will take no pleasure in anyone who turns away. So if that's the case, that means God takes pleasures in the ones that don't turn away. Come on. He takes pleasure in you. He takes pleasure in what you do. He takes pleasure when you, when you speak to him. Like I said, he likes the way your voice sounds. He likes the way you talk. He likes the way you walk. He likes the way you, you interact with your kids and your friends. He, he takes pleasure in you. And you guys need to start owning that. He takes pleasure in you. Stop beating yourself up. Because he's not beating you up. He's trying to gently guide you into where you need to be. So just take that correction. Know that it's gentle and make your correction and go for it. All right, last verse. But we are not like those who turn away from God to their own destruction. Declare this in your life. We are the faithful ones whose souls will be saved. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Okay, I hope that made sense. I was kind of emotional today, but uh, it's just, it's the gospel, guys. It's so, it's so real, and I, I've lived my life so sin conscious for so long that this is a really big deal to me. And I get really emotional about it because there's people that are living their life so focused on the junk that they do and not how good he is. Are we living with junk in our life, man? Let's just start focusing on the goodness of God and that he takes pleasure in you. And and there's a lot of people like like my friend I just had, he just thought God was so mad at him and he's not mad at you. He may not be pleased with you, right? Because you're not you turned away from him. But guess all it takes is easy to turn, right? 
turn. I'm going to turn right now. Golly, that was easy, right? And it's, it's like your thought process is easy to turn it. Stop with the junk. Do what God's asking you. Do what the Holy Spirit is leading and guiding you into. And then, yeah, then you'll be successful, right? Then you can lay, don't you want to lay your head down on your pillow and not have to worry about tomorrow? That would be really, really great. <laughs> don't you want to lay your head down on the pillow and just be like, ah, another day, God, we did it. And then just start thinking about those good things that you did with God throughout the day. And maybe at first it might not be that many. But why are we sitting there occupying our time with the junk? Like, why are you giving the devil the space in your brain and your thoughts to occupy that ground? It's yours. Take it. It's not his. You're just giving it to him. And God says, what are you doing? It's yours. Just take it and look at me. Oh, God, I'm struggling. Yeah, I know. Look at me. You know, look at me. I mean, I just feel like he's like, that's so why he's talking to me if I'm not listening and I'm hard headed. But it's just like, come on, guys. Look at him. Look at his face this week. And when you lay your head down on your pillow, see his face, not your struggles. Okay? Don't worry about tomorrow. It won't, it won't bring anything. Worry about, can I see his How good did I do at looking at you today, Jesus? Show me where I can do better. And it'll be a loving correction instead of, I can't believe you did this. I can't believe you've done this. (laughs) You got it, right? (laughs) Okay, I'm going to pray. If anybody needs any prayer, like, let's let's, let's do it. Let's handle business. Um, I hope this made sense today. Um, I hope we can take something from it. And just be with him, guys. He's happy with you. He's not mad at you. All right, Jesus, we worship you. We love you. We just ask you, Holy Spirit, to walk with us through our day-to-day, God, that when we put our head on the pillows, um, that it's your voice that we hear, and it's not the world beating us down on things that we did or didn't do. God, I just ask you to speak to us and how we bring you pleasure, how we bring you delight, God, and then just, just soft corrections on how we can get to where you want us to be, God. And I thank you that you will lead us and that you won't give us anything that we can't handle, God. And I thank you that you're loving and you're a merciful Father. I thank you that you're just. And I thank you that you're holy, God. I just ask you to help us to walk in holiness, God, being made holy. I thank you that You love us, you love us, and you love us, and you keep loving us, God. I thank you that you're not mad at us. I thank you that you're you're helping us. And if if there's anybody who who doesn't fully understand what we're talking about, God, I just ask you to to bury it deep in their hearts this week and, and bring up instances where we can do better, that we can that we can be better lovers of God. And just give us new strategies to love you and to worship you, God. And when we worship you, may we put something on it that it's not just words, that, that when we're, we're feeling bad and we're like, oh, I worship you, Jesus. No, I worship you, Jesus. I love you. There's nobody like you. God, I just ask you to put a real heart of worship in our, in our stomachs. God, that it's just a burning passion to seek your face and to love you and to do your will, God. I just ask that you instill that in us, that you make that a big rock priority in our life to love you and to honor you with our words and our actions, God. We just love you and we bless your holy name, God. There's nobody like you. We just magnify your holy name above everything else in our life. And we just give you your right place in our life, God. God, we put you first. And if we haven't put you first, if there's something else that we've put first, God, please tell us. Please love us so that we can put you where you belong and that we can, we can live a life that you've made us to live, God. God, I just ask you for blessings to rain down on us, God, that you, you know what we need before we ask, God. I just ask you to fulfill that miracle in our life, uh, to, to save that niece, to fulfill that bill, God. I just ask for you to just rain your blessings down on us, God. And I just ask 
for you to rain down your presence even more, God, that we can just be walking through the store. Ooh, I feel your presence. I feel you. It's you, God. God, may we feel your presence in our day-to-day activities and that, that we just don't go on and we live life as normal, God, that we actually turn and we look at your face and that we make time for you, legitimate time to just be in your presence without bringing all the junk God, I thank you. You help us with the junk, but sometimes you just want to be with us. We worship you, Jesus, and we love you, and there's nobody like you. Amen.